So our next session, after the Arab Spring, we have Mona al Thawi, Suleiman Adonia, Wali Nasser, Omar Barghouti, and Lale Khalili. And the session will be moderated by Gerard. Please welcome all of them on stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to see such a huge crowd. It's a very, very important subject. And we have uh, a very large panel of extremely distinguished people. And in fact, reading the list of their achievements is potentially going to take so long that I'm going to abbreviate it. Uh, Muna Tahawi, uh, uh, on the far side of the stage, an Egyptian feminist writer, author of Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. Uh, and next to Muna is Suleiman Adunya, who is a writer uh, of Ethiopian origin, in fact, who's lived in Saudi Arabia for many uh, years, and whose most recent novel, The Consequences of Love, is about forbidden love in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Omar Barghouti, the, the co-founder of Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, and author of the book of the same title, uh, subtitled The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. Uh, Professor Vali Nasr, Dean of the John Hopkins School uh, of Advanced International Studies, author of uh, the, the Shia Revival, on which he's speaking tomorrow, and also The Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy and Retreat. And then on my left, Professor Lale Khalili of the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, uh, uh, who has written Heroes and Martyrs in Palestine, and also Time in the Shadows, Confinement in Counterinsurgency. So I guess... Um, when I began uh, learning, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. When I began learning Arabic, I um, learned uh, by rote a uh, list of the leaders of the Arab world. You know, President Mubarak is the president of Egypt, uh, President Ben Ali is the president of Tunisia. And having learned that list in 1995, it went on being extremely useful to me. I could just carry on reciting it for about uh, 15 years because the names didn't change. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, uh, in 2011, it ceased to be so useful to me. I had to learn a whole lot of new names. Um, it's actually five years and uh, three weeks since Mohammed Bouazizi burnt himself to death in Tunisia, follow, uh, following which President Ben Ali uh, was forced to resign, fled the country. It is almost five years to the day since crowds gathered in Tahrir Square in Cairo in uh, a peaceful protest of vast scale. You know, even the crowds here at Jaipur do not in any sense compare with the million or so people that we've had gathering in Cairo, not once now, but actually twice, peacefully to cause presidents to fall. And in addition to that, of course, this was not a bloodless uh, process. Nearly a thousand people died in Egypt. And in the following few months and years, we've seen revolutions, some successful, some not, in Libya, Yemen, and Syria, and of course, uprisings also in Bahrain. But I guess, um, Munna, that in the subsequent five years, a lot of people have begun to talk about um, the Arab Spring turning to winter and so forth, as we've seen not only so much bloodshed, but also uh, a lot of resurgent autocratic governments as well. In your eyes, do you see, looking back, do you see the Arab Spring as a success or a failure? Right. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to just get rid of this phrase Arab Spring. I hate the phrase Arab Spring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because uh, revolutions and uprisings are not seasons, they're not flowers, they're not colors, they're not flavors. They're revolutions and uprisings that involve a great deal of risk and danger. And as you said, a thousand people died. Look at Syria and how many people have sacrificed their lives in Syria across the region. So I hate the phrase Arab Spring because it so easily gets turned into, oh, the Arab Spring has turned into an Arab winter. And basically the story of incredible courage, uh, millions of people risked their lives to go out there and fight decades of dictatorship. And dictatorship that wasn't propped up just by our own military and police forces but propped up by Western governments who understood exactly what those dictators were doing. Because a lot of those weapons used against us were given to them by Western governments. So these revolutions and uprisings had to happen because we deserve to be free. And I think the biggest success for me, for all the uprisings and revolutions in the region, is that you here and the entire world saw us, the people of the Middle East and North Africa, not all of whom identify as Arab, rising up and saying we deserve to be free because we were always looked at as the people who love the man with the iron fist. Why do we, human beings like everybody else, get put into this box of the people who love dictators? No, Egyptians, Moroccans, Tunisians, Palestinians, Syrians, everybody in the region deserves to be free. So the biggest success, I think, of the Middle East, uh, the Middle East North, and, and North African uprisings and revolutions is that they showed you people there want to be free. It's been very difficult, but I think that the, the best way for me to summarize why five years onto it, I refuse this, it has failed and we wish we had never done it, is when I was in Hungary. I was in Hungary a few months ago to promote my book. And I think the Hungarians, of all the people that I've spoken to about my book, understand exactly what it is to be where we are now. Because when they would, when they would ask me, excuse me, when they would ask, why has the revolution in Egypt or the Middle East and North Africa failed? I would ask them, how long did it take you to get over communism? And they would tell me, 25 years later, we're still not fully over the regimes that we had. So how in five years does the world that never thought we were capable of rising up, how in five years do you then expect us to have solved 60 years of military rule, dozens of security agencies that permeate every aspect of our lives, so I think that the, the revolutions and uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa are continuing. People continue to fight. And the biggest example of this, because tomorrow is the anniversary of, of my country's revolution, Egypt, is that our current fascist dictator, Abdel Fattah Sisi, who was met here by, the Indi by Modi in, in October. He was given $10 million by Modi. So your leader also supports my fascist dictator. Abdel Fattah Sisi is so scared of the revolution that he has filled the jails in Egypt with 40,000 people and he arrests and abducts in the middle of the night young people and we've had two Friday sermons saying that to protest tomorrow is a sin. If the regime in Egypt was confident and didn't fear the revolution, this would not be happening. The revolution very much continues and we will be free. Lale, the events, we call them the Arab Spring, but they were very different in different countries. Not only were there some countries where you didn't have mass protests. Uh, Jordan and Morocco are often pointed to because they're monarchies and yet there wasn't a sort of protest on the streets. They're not particularly rich. But you've also had among those which did have those protests such different outcomes. Libya, so anarchic, while Tunisia still looks as if it's got a functioning democracy. You may correct me, but it looks as if it does. What do you think has made for those differences? Um, I think I'd like to actually also say something about how it's almost impossible to actually assess the effects of the uprisings of 2011 in any sort of meaningful way, at least for another generation. Um, revolutions tend to have extremely long-lasting um, effects and their echoes tend to reverberate across generations. And those kinds of effects are often very difficult to see in the immediate aftermath because we're often standing very close to the deaths and destructions, um, to upturnings of regimes. Having said that, I think there's a whole number of reasons why, um, well, as a political scientist, we would look at the ways in which the uprisings occurred across the region and had different outcomes. And of course, there was a lot of uh, talk coming out of the Arabian Peninsula in particular about how the monarchies were stable. 
And of course, that completely ignores the fact that at the same time that you had these massive uprisings in Egypt, massive demonstrations which eventually turned violent in Syria, the uprisings in Libya and Yemen, in Li uh, both of which are, uh, ended up in civil wars, was that also at the same exact moment, in one of the places that is supposed to be this kind of a bulwark of stability, the Arabian Peninsula, you also saw massive demonstrations in all sorts of ways. Um, of course, everybody knows about Bahrain and the eventual intervention of Saudi Arabia in that country in order to suppress the uprisings there. But there were also massive strikes in Oman. There was an occupation of the Kuwaiti um, parliament by Kuwaiti youth. Uh, there were massive demonstrations in Qatif by citizens of Saudi Arabia in the eastern region of that country. And, uh, and even in places like Qatar and UAE, there was massive suppression of dissidents in order precisely to prevent any kind of echoes of those uprisings reverberating in those countries. Even in places which are ostensibly quite quiet, like Jordan and Morocco, uh, and in, indeed Algeria, actually, there were lots of bread demonstrations, demonstrations around questions of um, access to resources. Um, and in fact, Algeria currently is undergoing some of those things. Now, some of the reasons for this is, of course, the, the differential ability of those states to provide resources to their uh, citizenry in the immediate aftermath of the uprisings in most of the Arab world. For example, the monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula started bribing their citizenry with all sorts of rises in their salary and with uh, uh, financial handouts. But there are also other reasons. I mean, the existence of organized oppositions with disciplined kind of movements are quite significantly important in actually having different outcomes. And Tunisia, for example, had had a very thriving uh, union movement and a thriving opposition. Egypt had had a history of demonstrations, not only by unions, but also by informal sort of labor movements. And it has had a long history of political mobilization. And so these kinds of um, these kinds of activities by unions, by youth, by students, by actually feminist activists in all of these countries had extremely significant effect in the ways in which the outcomes turned out. Now, the extent to which they picked up arms, the extent to which there was foreign direct intervention as there was in Libya and in Syria and in Yemen and in Bahrain, the extent to which the citizenry could withstand the assault and, uh, and the oncoming counter-revolutionary movements, which was profoundly strong, um, it, of course, has determined the outcomes to a large extent. But I think the histories matter, but so do the current mobilization of the opposition in all of those countries. So if you were advising Muna on how to do it again, as it were, in Egypt, the organizing? I wouldn't dare advise any revolutionary in how to do it. One, because this is the Iranian flank. We Iranians shouldn't be advising the Arabs on what to do, <laughs> number one. Number two, I actually do believe that revolutions have a particular logic. A different country operates on a set of, uh, uh, well, on a, operates on an entirely different set of logics than a different country does, although, of course, there are similarities across the Arab world in the ways in which they triggered off one another, were inspired by one another, used one another's tactics, in fact, had connections of solidarity across borders. I think that cannot be underestimated. But I also do think that often in these revolutionary movements, you can have a catalyst, but the tactics and the strategies emerge in the cauldron of the action. And in fact, the better those tactics and strategies manage to adapt themselves to the particularity of the situation, the more successful a movement can be. So I can't really advise, because obviously the different situations are very fast moving and they work in very different ways. Suleiman, there's one other I mean, there are a number of Arab states where the majority of the population are not citizens. Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, Qatar, possibly also Kuwait. I can't remember the statistics for Kuwait. Kuwait, and Kuwait definitely. And so the majority of the people there are migrant workers, and this is an issue you've taken some interest in, who haven't on the whole risen up, or have they? And if, uh, if not, why not? Why so haven't there been revolutions by, by migrant workers in those countries? Um, I think there has been, maybe on a smaller scale. Uh, the question is why they've not been written about, why they have not been in the media. Uh, and I think the main problem or the main focus is, um, you know, probably they're not sexy enough. Uh, probably it's, um, you know, uh, also it has to do with a nation state, uh, citizen relationships, where I think um, the media, I mean global media, maybe they would 
uh, pay much attention if the citizens rise against their states rather than foreign workers, you know. Uh, but it's, you know, foreign workers are not passive. I mean, my mom was a domestic worker. Um, uh, you know, I, when I lived in Saudi Arabia as a young boy, I have seen her being abused, um, being humiliated, and uh, it's, it's quite emotional talking about this, uh, but nevertheless it has to be talked about because as we are here today, uh, I'm sure there's so many uh, workers from India, from Africa, uh, who are being abused uh, in many Arab countries, and I think uh, they deserve, you know, their stories deserve to be heard, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's fine to, uh, to just talk about the Arab uprising, but I think it's extremely important to pinpoint that uh, foreign workers have also not been passive and they've been active in pursuing their rights. I'd like to jump in on that because I think it's also really important to actually mention specific instances. Despite the fact that migrant workers are profoundly vulnerable in the countries of the Arabian Peninsula in particular, in the sense that they can be deported like that, there have been again and again and again instances of South Asian, of Ethiopian in particular, but also of Somali workers that strike, uh, that, that at the risk of being deported back home, end up uh, you know, putting down uh, tools, uh, end up walking off. And of course, the response in those instances is precisely to deport them. And there's very little protection against them because, of course, they also provide remittances to the states. And the states are not going to protect the, uh, the, the South Asians or the Ethiopians sure. or the sort of semi-existent Somali state is not going to pr provide protection to its citizens because it depends on those remittances and it doesn't want to piss, they don't want to piss off the Arabian Peninsula countries. They don't want to anger them. And so I think it's really important to note that these guys have been mobilizing, they and women been, yeah. actually. There have been uh, domestic worker uh, and, and also movements like, as well. I think it was in Saudi Arabia a few months ago where a lot of Ethiopians have protested and they have been deported. Yes. And so there is also the, the fear factors where a lot of workers, like uh, you said, um, you, know, uh, they, you know, it's because if you, if you protest and you call it, if you're an Arab citizen, uh, probably you are, you're going also through um, uh, prejudice and injustices, but, but the only solution for a migrant worker is it to, to be imprisoned and deported, and yes. deported towards that. I mean, I remember when I was living in Saudi Arabia, actually, uh, a lot of my relatives, they were deported back to Eritrea when actually Eritrea was in a state of war with Ethiopia. So. I suppose, just turning to you, Omar, when I was, uh, well, for about 15 years in the Middle East, the subject of Palestine was top of the news bulletins and the Arab news, it was front page of Arab press, but it was also the issue on which Arab governments would uh, come to governments in the West and raise with them as the principal thing that they objected to in Western policy was the fact that we didn't do enough to support the Palestinians, to put it mildly. Uh, these days, certainly looking in the West, but even looking at the Arabic press, the subject of Palestine has, has been eclipsed. Do you, when you look at the Arab Spring, has it been, what opportunities and what threats do you see for, for Palestine, for the issue, for your cause? Well, if uh, I agree that spring might not be the most accurate term, but one thing that is accurate about the spring metaphor is the fertility. That people showed the ability that there's fertile ground for protest, that people will no longer accept chains, and the first step of that is breaking the mental chains. That, uh, you cannot undo that. Youth in Egypt, activists in Tunisia, in Morocco, and everywhere, they've broken the chains, the fear chains, the, the mental chains, and you cannot take that away. And that has been going on in Palestine. So instead of seeing this as the issue of Palestine eclipsing in the mainstream Arab media, which it has, but the mainstream Arab media is mostly Saudi and Qatari controlled. So that might explain part of it. Does this reflect that the average Arab person no longer sees Israel's regime of oppression as the main enemy of the Arab world, it, it, it still does. The absolute majority of Arabs still do see Israel as a main enemy, despite all Saudi attempts to present Iran and other threats as the major threats, they have not yet succeeded in that. And the Palestinian cause is one of the few issues that unites uh, almost the entire uh, region, which I agree is not Arab, ethnically speaking. We need to redefine that term. Uh, um, so, in a way, yes, there's been a setback in terms of governments, uh, 
governments in the Arab world, new and old dictatorships, are openly uh, collaborating with Israel's regime of occupation and apartheid. But the Arab masses largely have been more involved with their local, domestic, social, economic justice issues, but that's extremely important as well because without freeing themselves of those chains, social economic chains, there's no way they can also rise up and help with that overarching issue of Palestine, which is an Arab issue. It's not just a Palestinian issue. So you remain an optimist, it sounds to me. There's quite an optimistic Yes, Yes, I, 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 I'm on the optimistic side because I agree revolutions don't happen in, in, a, in a very linear way, in a, in a given uh, time frame. It, they take a longer time. People might have broken the, the mental chains, but breaking the actual chains of social and economic injustice and gaining their rights is a messy process that we need to learn. It's not necessarily a linear path. Um, there's a Tunisian writer who actually says what, what you say very beautifully and emotionally. Unfortunately, I can't remember his name. But when he was asked after the Tunisian revolution began, how do you feel today, and specifically about Palestine and, and the, the fight for, for Palestinian liberation, he said, my mind is very much in Tunisia and in France, because that's where my intellectual background is. My feet are firmly planted in Tunisia, but my heart is in Palestine. And this, why, this was, was by way of talking about how we need to liberate ourselves here in our countries, as Egyptians, as Tunisians, before we can offer help to Palestinians, because our regime has always used this as this, you know, what I, I, call, I call Israel the opium of the Arab people, because that's how our regimes have used it, to basically silence any kind of internal dissent. So I think it's important to recognize that what was happening internally was by way of liberating ourselves from all kinds of occupations, not just external occupations, but internal occupations as well. Mm. And actually, sociologically, now, the, again, the academic here, um, one of the things that's really interesting is that a lot of the movements that started in Egypt, actually a lot of the youth activists have gotten their training in how to, for example, run the gamut of security, how to counter uh, tear gas, how to do protests during pro-Palestinian demonstrations in 2002, and again in t various kinds of assaults in, of in, in Israel. Ferguson, and, and in Ferguson as well. Yes. And, and so there is a way in which organization by Egyptian activists around the question of Palestine gave them, I mean there were other forms of organization, as I mentioned, union activism also was really important, but youth activists in particular got their training on how to do the kinds of um, protests that they were doing and doing earlier forms of mobilization and very prominent among which was pro-Palestinian protests in Cairo, Alexandria, Port Said and elsewhere. And when you talk Mona, about the internal occupation, one of the, th I mean your, the theme of your book is sexual revolution. And I wanted, therefore, to ask you as well, not just about the political side of the Arabs, okay, Arab uprisings. the uprisings in the Middle East, <laughs> as I think we should probably say, well, even Arab is probably a word we should deconstruct, but um, about whether, you know, one sometimes hears that there has been great social change forward, sometimes people say backward. What do you see? Do you see any, any, anything approaching the sexual revolution that you, you wrote about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we were talking earlier in the green room, and as, and as I told you, Gerard, I think after I finished writing my book, um, the premise of which uh, is, is that without a social and a sexual revolution, our political revolutions will fail. I have seen many instances of this social and sexual revolution because the way that I, the, the way that I see the uprisings and revolutions happening, specifically when it comes to women. Now, these revolutions, these uprisings, were not about gender equality and gender liberation. These were about women and men rising up against dictators who oppress everyone. Because often when you talk about feminism, people will say to you, well, you know, men aren't free either. That we'll talk about women, you know, when we liberate all our political prisoners, when we fix the economy, when we fix the weather, as if women are some kind of fluff luxury issue that we will get to and not half of society. So these, these uprisings were men and women rising up against the dictator who oppresses everyone. But there are other forms of dictatorship. And when women went home, it became apparent that we might have risen up against the Mubarak in the palace, but there's a Mubarak on the street corner and there's a Mubarak in the home. And we have to rise up against all of those Mubaraks. And the hardest Mubarak to rise up against is the Mubarak in the home, because all dictators go home. And all dictators at home, they use religion and they use culture, and that's always used against us, but it's not our culture. Whose culture is it? to want to suppress half of society, and why should I obey that culture? 
the Latino lesbian in intellectual and poet Gloria Anzaldúa has said one of my favorite sayings of all time. I will not glorify a culture or a heritage that hurts me in the name of protecting me. And that's the social and sexual revolution. And that's what women I'm seeing across the region. And I'm sure here in India as well, because I've spoken in India many times. This is what connects us as feminists and as women around the world. And when it comes specifically to social and, and, and sexual issues, I often give the example of an LGBT movement that got a license recently in Tunisia. Now, unfortunately, that license was recently revoked, again, as a way, as a signal of how much the regimes fear people fighting back and saying, we will not obey you anymore. Egypt has many LGBT activists, has many feminist activists. Uh, the, the, the fact that the, our fascist dictator, as I call him, Sisi, is on a moral crusade against anyone, there, there's, a, there's a hierarchy here. The top of the hierarchy is the conservative, very religious, very straight, very proper male. Anyone who deviates from that is hounded by the regime. So we, we're undergoing a moral crusade in Egypt right now because there is a social and sexual revolution happening. And that moral crusade is against tra the, the transgender community, the LGBT community generally. Many gay men have been arrested, belly dancers and pop stars. Now I want you to ask yourself, what is more dangerous here? To have a, a, a dancer or a pop star load a video, upload a video on YouTube of herself singing, or as we had during the revolution, a young Egyptian woman put a picture of herself naked in her parents' living room. Online, you have to go onto her website to see it. Is that more damaging and is that more insightful to violence than a military regime sexually violating women with so-called virginity tests, than a military regime that sends thugs into the street to beat and sexually assault women? What's more dangerous here? And why are they going after women because they're inciting debauchery? Why are they going after gay men who want to live their lives openly because we are undergoing revolution for inciting debauchery? And there are other examples from across the region. In Morocco, there's a, a great feminist activist I know called Ibtissam Betty Lashkar, who has a movement that, that fights for LGBT rights and reproductive rights. And she gets regularly beaten up because she's considered a dangerous revolutionary. So they, the social... Se the social and sexual revolution has begun, and if anything, it's much more dangerous than the political revolution. Valia, I wanted to bring you in and to change the subject a tiny bit, or possibly you'll tell me that I'm not. Because if, if you've been following the Arab world very, very uh, remotely, I guess none of us have. Maybe you haven't either, but many in Britain or America will have heard of basically the Arab Spring, or whatever we call them but then they'll have heard of the Islamic State. And I guess there may seem then, in the eyes of some, to be some kind of connection, some association between those two, some the one leading to the other. Would you talk to us a bit about the events of the last five years geopolitically and how that has contributed to the emergence of the Islamic State and what, what the connection, if any, does it have with the events of 2011? Well, uh, let me actually start by turning, uh, turning uh, uh, the, the question you posed at the beginning, was the Arab Spring a success or a failure, and put it differently. Uh, the important thing is, that it, was it historically significant? Was it a significant uh, marker in the history of the region? And the answer to that is very clear, that uh, although we didn't see other than uh, Tunisia a success of a smooth transition uh, to democracy, at least this time around, uh, it's very clear that the, the Arab Spring has, has significantly eroded state institutions within the societies in which this happened. Namely, uh, 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 even in Tunisia, the, the relationship between state and society changed in, in Libya, in Syria, in, in Iraq. Actually, state institutions have significantly collapsed. And that is a very important uh, uh, outcome of the protest. I mean, it was not the intent of the protest to break the state, but in effect, in most many places, they have broken the state. And at a larger level, in fact, if you look from afar, the, the, the Arab world, which under dictatorship appeared stable and solid and, and, and uh, the important sort of bastion of power in the Middle East, in many ways, has broken down. It has not recovered uh, from the protests. Regimes used uh, strategies for survival, um, either re outright repression, dividing the population, uh, 
along sectarian lines. Uh, but those, even those regimes are not comfortable uh, uh, after the, the suppression. And as I said, elsewhere, this has completely collapsed. There is a vacuum. And in that vacuum, uh, you have uh, all sorts of forces that have come up. I mean, we can talk about where did the Islamic State come from and uh, you know, what are its roots, what does it want. But I think the most significant uh, uh, aspect about it is that not since World War I has any kind of a political movement, particularly within the Arab world, redrawn the maps of the region. So if you took, uh, looked at Iraq and Syria, two extremely important uh, Arab states. I mean, in a European context, this would be like saying France and Germany losing control of large parts of their territory to a, not just non, a non-state actor, but a non-state actor that is, has claims to being a state or carving an entire region out of these countries along sectarian lines, declaring a caliphate, I mean, a caliphate is a religious concept, but it also essentially portends to be a, a political institution. I think that's the most significant aspect about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the Islamic State, and I think it's an important legacy of the Arab Spring. Revolutions, although you know, I have trouble thinking about the Arab Spring as a revolution in the classic sense of a, you know, re like something like the Chinese-Russian revolution where you have ideology and dialectics, but these are not often happy events. They're not direct events. There are very few examples in history where you've had a smooth transition from dictatorship uh, uh, to democracy without it having major uh, disruption. And I think uh, the Islamic State is essentially born in what is really collapse uh, that has come uh, after, the, um, after the Arab uprisings. And, 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 and I think that for now is this most important legacy. It's what makes it very significant. Um, there's a very famous and fabulous quote from Antonio Gramsci, which is, but he says, when the old order dies and the new order is yet to be born, the interregnum is a time of monsters. Right. And, uh, and I think this is the interregnum. And the old order is dying. Um, I don't think it's entirely a political transformation. I don't think it is only about state collapse. I think there are massive transformations happening in the way in which the region is uh, changing socially. Um, there are shifts in population from rural areas into cities at speeds which were not seen uh, in the 60s and 70s, which was a time of massive urbanization in the region. There is a massive transformation in the economic basis and the ability of the states to actually uh, properly plan for these economies. There is a, there's a massive expansion of uh, youth populations in these areas who are demanding um, access to jobs, but also access to dignity. And, and I think that these kinds of social transformations have foretended, in so, uh, some senses, have foretold the end of the era that came in the post-colonial moment. Um, and I think the end of that era, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it, as, as things have transformed in this huge sort of way, um, and yet we don't have any clear sense of what is supposed to come next, it is in that moment of social upheaval where you do see the most violence, where you do see these organizations that have been born not just of the Arab uprising. I mean, the roots of ISIS really go back to the uh, US invasion and destruction of Iraq in 2003. And, uh, and, and its history of support for these kinds of movements. And also, in, in, you know, the, the, many of these guys actually served in US prisons, and so in, in US prisons and detention centers in Iraq. And so in some senses, these kinds of monsters are born in that moment. And I think once we have a clearer sense of what the future will be, once there's a clearer sense of political mobilization towards a particular goal, whether ideological or some other form of, po of politics, I think then that the ISIS will wither away in some senses. It will become much, more, much less of a monster and much more of something that we could flick away, hopefully. We were talking, Omar, before about the role of the West and, uh, you know, it's a little bit, as Lali has mentioned, the history of support for Islamist movements you raised as well, uh, but also, of course, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But do you think there's anything good that outsiders can do at all? Yes, I mean, outside governments are very much a domestic factor in the Arab world. They're never hiding behind the screen. They're very much dominant players in Arab domestic politics be it uh, with the dictatorships, uh, maintaining those dictatorships, uh, giving uh, support in initially to the rise of Taliban, uh, to Al-Qaeda, uh, eventually to Daesh, ISIS, and so on, 
they're always uh, playing that role. The only hope comes from people, from citizens, from social movements in the West, not so much from governments. We don't expect much from governments because they're not answering to their own populations on certain issues. I mean, this Western democracy is becoming more and more of an oxymoron to an extent. I mean, it's, it's really sad. But, but, uh, but we're seeing a rise, for example, as far as Palestinians are concerned. There's certainly a rise of support for the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, for example. That's unprecedented. We've never seen this much American grassroots support churches, trade unions, women's movements, uh, LGBT groups, and it's amazing, the growth, the mushrooming of support for Palestinian rights at a time when Congress is entirely Israeli-occupied territory. Well, uh, I, I, I think it's also very important uh, not to, uh, and particularly because this is a tendency within the region, to sort of abdicate any kind of agency and responsibility and put it all on, 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 on the Westerners. Uh, there is plenty of, uh, there is plenty of uh, examples of uh, the tail wagging the dog. Uh, in other words, uh, take the case of the Taliban. Yes, the Americans uh, supported the Mujahideen in Afghanistan uh, in order to fight against the Soviet Union, but the responsibility for the operation creation funding of the Taliban rests with Pakistan, not with the United States. Uh, uh, and Saudi and, Arabia. And Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. And, and why they did that uh, is not that somebody necessarily called them and said, do this, is because they have their own agendas and they found this useful. I mean, the, the neighbors of Syria, uh, not to name names, have had a lot more to do with the creation of ISIS funding. I mean, you know, ISIS fighters from Europe uh, you know, could not be projected by projectiles into Syria. They went through neighboring countries. U.S. allies. The, under well, US no, no, but those. Uh, yeah, they are allies, but they have their own agenda, and they, they actually want this to happen, and they they by subterfuge and otherwise. So you know, you can get into the airports of these countries as tourists and exit as a terrorist, and arrive at a, a border of border of Syria and join join the fighters. So there is responsibility within the region. Um, and, I, and I think we should have it put it in, in, in a right perspective that way. Can I just, when, it, when it comes to the West, can I, I, this is what I would like the West to do. I would like the West to stop thinking that we're all either uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Salafi supporting Muslims, that's one flavor of Muslim, or Daesh, ISIS wannabes. Those are the only two boxes that we're allowed to have. And I actually, and I think the, the biggest way that the West is helping us is the GOP debates. I hope you're all watching. These crazies called the Republicans debate their country's politics because, because every, every time they get on that stage and you see 10 men deciding what I can do as a woman with my body, that is the wet dream of Daesh and the Muslim Brotherhood and Saudi Arabia. And, and religious fundamentalism is not something that my region invented. Religious fundamentalism is in power in the United States. And if we get someone that racist, bigoted <laughs> Donald Trump to rule America, we are in trouble. So then, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to pin the whole responsibility on the West. And I think that's very, very popular in the Arab world. Uh, the reality is, I think, for example, uh, the Arab states have been stirring all anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish sentiments while they basically are racially uh, committing atrocities, no, I wouldn't say atrocities, but uh, racist behavior against Palestinians, refugees in Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon, in Jordan. So I think the two, um, uh, we, need to, we need to actually discuss the kind of uh, the relationships between um, Arab responsibilities, Arab states' responsibility, uh, responsibilities also in, in the kind of Palestinian-Israeli situation? I, I think it's, it's not an either-or, and it's not a dichotomy, yeah. really. In many cases, those factors all work together. And we're not talking about uh, you know, Arab regimes that are anti-US, God forbid. Yeah. I mean, they're all within the realm of US power and influence. Yes. So the US allows certain Arab governments, like the Saudi government, to get away with massive human rights violations. It allows Turkey to get away. Of course, Turkey is acting on its own, for its own agenda. But it's, it's given, and Pakistan as well, they're allowed through US support to do what they do in supporting Taliban, in supporting uh, ISIS, in the, in the case of Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and, and so on.
if the US were, wants to stop ISIS tomorrow, they will turn Turkey, not one barrel of oil passes the, South, the, the Syrian border, and they will stop it. But they're not telling them that. So I'm not saying there's no Turkish factor, there's no Saudi factor, but the overarching, much more powerful factor is US complicity in maintaining this strife and conflict. And if you were making predictions, Ali, if you were looking for the Middle East in 10, 20 years time, uh, what would you be looking for? What do you expect? I, I know you're down as a very uh, savvy predictor of the future, which is a, a very much hostage to fortune, isn't it? But anyway, give us a, a little bit of a prediction, if you don't mind. Well, you know, nobody can have a crystal ball, and particularly because of the amount of complexities that have been mentioned. But, but I, I think, it, uh, first of all, all the issues that we believe caused the Arab uprisings are still there. So that's not gone away, and I agree. This is, uh, and that's for that reason, I, I, I think that thinking about this as success or failure, I think is the wrong way of thinking about it. So issues of uh, youth unemployment, lack of dignity, lack of political freedom, lack of development, lack of development the, 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 the social gender issues that were mentioned, these are all still there. And you know, Gen General Sisi has, no, uh, has not presented any plan for how these might be resolved. It's basically maintaining a status quo. So, so it's anybody's guess when Egypt will blow up again, uh, or, or, or at least the status quo would be disturbed. And, and, uh, and the process of re rebuilding state institutions in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, and Iraq is going to be very difficult. Uh, I think you know, the, these societies, something major in it has broken. It's not a given even they might reemerge in the existing territorial boundary. The negotiation for any kind of a final settlement is difficult. I mean, we could look at the civil war in Lebanon. It took 15 years before they came to an agreement to end the civil war and uh, some kind of a truce and still being uh, in, a, in a big problem. But there are some fundamental shifts happening. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal and Iran's re-entry into the region is going to change, is going to bring big change. And again, that's not going to happen overnight. But uh, you know, the Middle East had been run essentially uh, as an American, you know, Arab authoritarian Arab uh, uh, regimes and American alliance maintaining security, stability around Israel's borders internally, and that alliance is in tatters. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, the Iranians are, are, are coming back in the region. So you know, the political map of the region is going to be very different. If I was to say the very hopeful thing uh, is you know, Iran would be far more open and on the path of sort of reintegration uh, 10 years from now, and that would be a good thing for the region. But I don't think uh, the, uh, even the countries that we think are stable today uh, under Arab authoritarian Arab regimes will actually be stable uh, uh, 10 years from now. And, and one very important factor here, in addition to the fact that the job of the Arab Spring is not complete yet, uh, and the problems are there, is that the, with the current oil prices, it's going to be very difficult to maintain this status quo. So, so the patronage systems, uh, even, you know, just to finish it, you know, when Arab Spring happened, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia promised $65 billion to silence his population. And now his grandson is actually uh, trying to dismantle those entitlements. So, you know, very simple logic. If entitlement meant stability, if that was the Saudi calculation two years ago, how are they actually calculating this? That if you took away that $65 billion, somehow stability would remain? So, you know, we. I, I don't think Saudi Arabia or, or, or Egypt can sustain the current, uh, the current scenario, especially because a lot of Egypt's stability is paid for by Saudi Arabia right now. Mm. So more instability in the Arab world? Well, I think the job is not done. You know, the, the, the Arab Spring uh, sort of made a mess of it, if you would. The, uh, the, the Arab uprisings brought down states, you know, created the, the situation. That's not finished. And, and the issues that Arab Spring even socially, politically put on the table are still sitting on the table. The population is still young, as Vera said, is still unemployed, still doesn't have a future. The Palestinian issue still is not resolved. I mean, you know, there's nothing, nothing has been resolved. And if this is, these issues were big enough for the region to erupt, uh, 
you would assume it's going to erupt again. Uh, as I said, the only hopeful story in the Middle East is sort of the bearing of the fact that Iran has made a decision to uh, perhaps uh, toy with coming back into the global order, but even that is causing uh, a turbulence uh, of its own. So I think we're in, a, we're for, in for a rough ride, but we're not going to get to a better place until, until these issues are resolved. How come in Latin America it seemed that dictatorships became democracies so much more easily than it's happened in the Arab world? Well, not all of them became very quickly democracies. We don't have much oil no. there, except for Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela. <laughs> no, uh, well, that, there is actually a point here. I mean, without, without Saudi, and, and even if you put a parenthesis around the US, without something like $30 billion being spent by Saudi Arabia in Egypt in the past two, three years, the, the, the Sisi regime would not have been able to reestablish authoritarianism. So that kind of a money didn't exist in Brazil to intervene in Argentina, nor did the Brazilians lose sleep at night if the Argentinians were democratic or were under And they've Muslim had a rally. dynamic civil society for a much longer time. Yes. It's yes. just not discussed in the Western dominant media. But they've had social movements that are very, very strong across Latin America where we can learn a lot of lessons. Yeah. For example, the new left, so-called new left, which is the undogmatic left, has been thriving in Latin America, whereas it's a new phenomenon across the Arab world. Yes. But, but ju just to, to add one other big difference is, is in the heart of the Middle East, you have divided societies. And whenever you have political change, there are winners and there are losers. I mean, this morning I was listening to an excellent panel on the partition. And it's an interesting question that a, a, a movement that started for freedom of all Indians from British colonialism at, at some point in time became a, uh, the, the gr one of the greatest human tragedies of, of, of the 20th century where uh, uh, you know, populations turned on one another and, and in the end you had uh, division of, of, of the subcontinent. So you know, we have Kurds and you have Shias and you have Sunnis and they've lived in states without uh, a, a proper division of power and the, you know, any change in the balance of power has, uh, you know, poses some serious questions. Is there, I mean, this is a really delicate issue, but is, what role does religion play in this? Can you have a transition to democracy and civil society so easily for as long as the role of religion is as powerful as it is in the Arab world? Because it, largely the decay of religion somewhat, some decay preceded the movement towards democracy in Latin America and even in Europe. Well, I mean, the religion part of it, I'll let Mona well, yeah. answer. I, I would only say there are two, the, you know, the issue of sectarian identity is much, much more interest, e easy to sort of think, at least when you talk about this issue in the subcontinent. It's like communalism. It's not about necessarily practicing. It, it becomes sort of, it's identity politics. And, and the reality is right now you have Saudi Arabia and Iran competing. One is Shia, one is Sunni, uh, uh, sectarianism. Uh, works uh, in, in Bahrain, in Qatif, if you rally the Sunni population against the Shias. You know, this part of it is not really, it's not really about religion, it's really about identity. Well, I mean, it's about religion, it's fundamentalism, that's right, which is that's really right. scary. It's not religion per se, but fundamentalism. Religion in Latin America was very pro-liberation, liberation theology. Catholic priests were aiding the revolution in El Salvador, across Latin America, Central America. We don't have a liberation theology yet in the Arab world. Islamic liberation theology, it's very, very weak. But fundamentalism is growing and being funded by hundreds of millions of dollars. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others are funding fundamentalism in our mosques, in our communities. This is the message that school kids are getting and so on. That is a danger to, to the people of but the region and to the world. I, I, no, I think it's religion as well. I don't think it's just fundamentalism because I think that the way that Islam is taught across the region, in, even in non-fundamentalist environments, is to obey. We don't have, like that's why I gave the example of, and this is a state, obviously the state benefits from this, but it happens on a familial level as well, that you are taught to obey those who are older than you, those who you have to show respect to, and it's part and parcel of religion in the sense that it's been institutionalized that way in Egypt through something like Al-Azhar. And we have Al-Azhar University is one of the oldest universities in the world, and it's the, it's the place that, that graduates all these clerics that go and teach across the world. Now in Egypt, the way that Al-Azhar has been used is to give legitimacy to the government, and Al-Azhar doesn't consider itself fundamentalist. If anything, the government likes to think that it's using Azhar 
against the fundamentalists who are the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi movement, so ones more to the right. But what, what has ended up happening is that so many people have become disillusioned with Al-Azhar because of the politicization of the clerics there. And I gave the example of the two Friday sermons in the run-up to the anniversary of our revolution. And these are sermons, so you have to have a license to, have, to, to, to give the Friday sermon in Egypt. Unlicensed mosques are shut down, and the, the Ministry of Endowments gives out instructions to clerics about what they can and can't say in Friday prayers. So they have, you know, a captive audience there. And for the past two weeks, their sermon on Friday has been, it is a sin to go out and protest. Now contrast that to one, to the most famous cleric who was killed in a revolution, who coincidentally was a childhood friend of mine. This was Sheikh Imad Afat. I knew him when I was a child in Egypt. And he was, he was killed. We believe he was killed by the army in December of 2011. Because even though he worked at Al-Azhar, he was the kind of cleric that tells you the liberation theology that you're talking about, Omar. Because he would get people calling him up and asking for a fatwa, police. So he'd get called by police asking him, is it ever okay to shoot, to open fire at demonstrations? And he said, it's never okay. This cleric would work at Al-Azhar during the day, remove his clerical robes, and wear a t-shirt and jeans at night, and go to Tahrir Square, where he would say, the air in Tahrir Square is purer than the air in Mecca. This is a cleric, because he was saying that freedom is purer than the way that our regime is using religion, even in the so-called moderate religion, even though I hate that word moderate, of Al-Azhar. So why is my childhood friend, Ahmad Afad, shot dead, this cleric? Because he would say torture is a sin, dictatorship is a sin. We never hear our clerics saying this. So of course religion is a part of this, until our clerics are on our side. And this is where the Shia in Saudi Arabia have done this. The Shia in Saudi Arabia, in the form of, uh, remind me of the name of the cleric who was at Nemer. 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 Sheikh Nemer. Now, I'm not a religious person, and I don't need my freedom and liberation theology to come from a religious symbol. But the fact that Sheikh Nemer would get on a, state, or on a pulpit and say, the Saudi regime, the Assad regime, the Bahraini regime, any regime, dictatorship is a sin, that's when we start talking about liberation theology. Can, can uh, I think um, I, um, we have to pin some of responsibilities on Arab population themselves when it comes to, minor, uh, to minority rights. Um, because the people who actually live, the poor workers, are not only abused by the state, they are abused by uh, ordinary citizens. And I think it's very, very important to pay attention to that. So I think when you... Um, when you were talking about the uh, future of um, Arab Spring, uh, one of my hope um, is that the Arab street actually is capable of fighting for multifaceted uh, human rights. Uh, they, uh, I hope they will understand that for the same, that they've been fighting, they've been uprising against the state for their dignity, that they also the foreign workers also deserve their dignity. Uh, and I also hope that a lot of Arab population who come into the United States or to across Europe, they will see that actually uh, um, their rights are respected in some way and they have the opportunities if they're not happy with what is in existence to fight for their rights. So my hope is uh, these people who actually live in the West, they would also have the opportunity to fight for minority rights in their own societies. Thank you. <laughs> I think we've got about 10 minutes left, if I'm right. So uh, we've got, oh, lots of questions, my goodness. I will try and do them sort of sector by sector. Can I have this gentleman here with the glasses in the front, front row? Hi, uh, my question is to Ms. al -Tahawi. So you find that the Egyptians who rallied in the streets of Tahrir Square against President Morsi, you had Tamarrud, you had student movements, you had women coming out of the streets. Why is it that they've silently accepted the oppression of Abdul Fattah al-Sisi? Right. Because I work with Egyptians. In fact, I happen to be a migrant worker in Saudi Arabia. It also happens that I was born in Qatif. So as an Indian, yeah. as one of the few people in Saudi Arabia who actually comes from a democratic nation, I happen to work with Arabs, with Pakistanis, uh, with Shias, with Sunnis. Yeah. And I, I come to this conclusion that all kinds of Arabs and people all around the world, they want democracy, but they, 
when they get that democracy, they can't really enjoy it. They don't know how to enjoy it. And I feel that they're primed to enjoy strong men in power. That's, so, that's exactly the very thing that I said is the stereotype that I fight at the very beginning of my comments. No, look, it's really important to recognize that we are not silently accepting Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Tamarrud has now been seen to have been infiltrated by the military. Tamarrud was something that was used by the military rulers of Egypt who have never gone away. We, we never ended military rule when we got rid of Mubarak. We got, one, we got rid of one facet of a regime, but we didn't get rid of the entire regime. So Tamarud now has been largely discredited in Egypt as a movement that was used by the military. But here's my position on, on Morsi. Morsi was placed uh, against or ran against someone in, in what I call a false choice. In Egypt, we were put before the, before the false choice of someone from the Muslim Brotherhood and someone from the military. And that is not a choice. I, I refuse to play this false choice. It's not a, a proper choice. When Morsi took over, those of us who did not want him as president, and I, I boycotted the presidential poll. I wanted neither, neither nor. Those of us who had to accept Morsi as a, rea a reality wanted him to serve as a transitional president, to, to be the revolutionary president. And he was not that. Morsi instituted a constitutional coup in November of 2012 that, that preceded what Sisi did to him. Morsi strengthened the military. Morsi promoted Sisi. Morsi ended up sowing the seeds of his own destruction by promoting Sisi from the head of military intelligence to our defense minister. So instead of siding with us, the revolution, in that triangle, the, the regime, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the revolution, Morsi sided with the military. So he sowed the own seeds of his, of his, this, his destruction. I absolutely and totally reject the military rule of Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, as have many people. But you know, one of the things that Sisi did, he made it illegal to protest. People who have been not even on, in protests themselves, just passing by protests, are now serving 15 years in jail. So he's made it almost, he's tied our hands behind our back. Let, but believe take, me, we are fighting. Let's take another question and, and keep them very short if we could and keep the answers short as well. Gentleman in the blue check shirt over there who had his hand up, he's about ooh, 10 rows back. Um, he's standing up. There he is, yes. Uh, my question is to you. You use the phrase opium of the people, where, you know, Israel is used in the Middle East a lot. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with that as an everyday citizen? What is really the solution to it? The reason I ask is because you can see a parallel maybe in Pakistan, where the specter of an Indian threat has been used for a very long time by the government, the ISI, and the army as both a means of control and propaganda. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Well, you deal with it by fighting the authoritarians who are trying to blind you to their own crimes against you. This isn't just exclusive to Egypt or India and Pakistan. This is why I brought up Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a great manipulator of fear. And the fear that he uses is the refugees who are coming, the Mexicans who are coming to rape and, and murder us, all of that. So it's always really convenient to authoritarian fascist regimes to create this external enemy for you that you have to constantly focus on rather than focus on their own shortcomings and how they're screwing up your country. So focus on them. They're, they're your enemy, number there's one a, enemy. There's a lady about uh, ooh, 12 rows back whom I saw before. You might stand up and then, yeah, that, that's right. Thank you. Hello. Oh, thank you for this really insightful uh, session. But my question is to either Mr. Nasr or Ms. Khalidi. Um, as we've seen that revolutions, for them to succeed, they require mass support. But also in the Middle East, there has been a tendency of these revolutions to radicalize throughout time. So while, say, in Syria or in Egypt, they might start out as revolutions or as people's movements, there is a, there is a fundamentalist undercurrent to them a lot of the times. So what do you think is the flaw in the model that is leading to, say, the rise of the ISIS in, say, Syria? Or what is it that is the flaw in the model that has led to Muslim Brotherhood gaining so much power in, say, Egypt? Um, I, I think Syria is a very special case in this regard. Part of the reason that the revolution there, the, or the revolutionary movement, the uprising there, didn't develop into a mass movement is for two reasons. One. It is the extraordinary success of the Assad regime previous to starting this in imprisoning, killing, destroying the heads of any kind of opposition movement across the spectrum, across the political spectrum. So I think that is really hugely significant. But second, and I think this cannot be underestimated, is the extent to which the opposition was organized beforehand. 
what you had was actually lots of fragmented movements in lots of places. And in fact, in Damascus and Aleppo, which are the two largest cities in uh, Syria, you did not have an urban movement that could start and could pick up and uh, pick up where a lot of the rural demonstrations or in smaller secondary cities like um, Homs al Hama had, had, had seen the demonstrations to pick those up. And again, part of that had been precisely because the Assad regime had had such a success in destroying those opposition movements. But I think those two reasons are sociological reasons. Cannot be underestimated the extent to which external sources, particularly at that stage, the Gulf, also had a role in uh, selling arms, sending arms, and arming special groups within Syria itself in order to A, derail what could have been a very democratic movement, and B, to have some form of internal control over the course of the events. So those are, those are, I think, the reasons why you've had this. It's not so much a flaw in the model as the particular politics of that country. There's, a, there's someone Philip, holding up a, a sweatshirt, I think it is, or possibly a towel that we can. <laughs> that tactic works, huh? It's a good tactic. Is, is there anyone at the back, by the way, back at the back, who wants to ask any questions? I don't see so many. Sort of one vaguely towards the back. Please go ahead. Yeah, so my question is to the entire panel. Um, is there also a revolution required in the way we think of democracy itself? Because democracy is supposed to be for the people, but also by the people. And I ask this because three times on the panel it was repeated, we can't expect anything of governments. Uh, we have to reform state institutions. And there was not adequate choice in uh, the people who could lead us. So I, I have this question for, for writers, for uh, activists, for um, academicians even, who, um, who they, they feel considerable influence. So perhaps is it now time to think of democracy as by the people? And we are the people who sort of need to step into the political system, instead of just saying they are not allowing us to do a certain thing. Um, yeah, I, I think democracy is, is quite not uh, understood and not really practiced in much of the world. And I'll start with, uh, with the home of democracy in the West. Western societies tend to think of themselves as you know, perfect liberal, or not perfect, but liberal democracies that the whole world should learn uh, from. But in many cases, in most cases, especially the United States, but not just the United States, it's turning more and more into a plutocracy or oligarchy, if you will, where the rich and the most powerful make all the main decisions. The people affect very little, very, very little, in terms of where the budget is spent, the militarization of society, security, social services, and so on. And I think this American model is being copied to an extent with some variations in the United Kingdom, across Europe. We're seeing it on the Palestine question, as well on, on many progressive questions. It's the banks, the oil companies, the military establishment that have wielded much more power than the citizens. That has to be challenged from the grassroots up with social movements mainly. And Vani? Well, uh, I mean, how you write your constitutions and what are your rules of election, you know, th these things uh, matter. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, too much democracy also can create uh, political uh, chaos as well, and, and, and partly the uh, organizing uh, uh, into uh, winner take uh, 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 or, or just uh, presidential systems, etc., has to do with some economic, social questions as well. But you know, we're not talking about an actual mature democracy and its problems in the Middle East. We're talking about democratization, and it's important to s sort of know that there are much, there are very few successful cases of democratic transition. It's almost like a unicorn phenomenon. It, there's many more cases of, of false starts, of collapses, of, of the process being derailed either by coups or, or civil wars or after a period of time after the first uh, political contest uh, having difficulties. In, in others, we have to know that you know, the ideal is democracy, but, but we should expect that a, a, a successful case is actually a rarity and it requires a lot of things going right from outside as well as economically, socially, etc. For instance, homogeneous societies are much more likely to succeed early on than divided societies. The honor of asking the last question is going to go to the lady in the denim jacket in the, in the third row. She's, so she's the holding a water bottle. Anybody who's waving something. <laughs> and I'm very sorry to everybody else. Uh, hi, my question is to Miss Mona. Uh, so we hear so many things and we read so many different things. So in reality, is polygamy, um, female circumcision, and mandatory for women to cover up actually there in the Holy Quran? Is it written? 
Oh, FGM, female genital mutilation, is not in the Quran. Polygamy is in the Quran, but it's often, um, when you talk to people about it, when you want to argue about it on a religious basis, it's often prefaced with the notion and the reminder that it also says in the Quran, if you can't be equal to all your four wives that you're allowed to have, then you should only have one. And what was the last one? Forced veiling? Yeah. Not, not the, forced veiling. the idea of modesty is in the Quran, but how that modesty is actually enacted in real life is not in the Quran. But all of those three things, Mona wants to ban, <laughs> or Mona wants to get rid of, and Mona is a Muslim. And so Mona is constantly in, um, in, in wrestles with the Quran and wrestles with with what I call uh, Islamic feminism. Uh, feminists uh, like Amina Wadud and Ziba Mir Husseini and many others who belong to a movement called Musawa, which means equality, that I belong to, but I belong to it as a secular Muslim. And all of those things have to be fought. When it comes to polygamy, it clearly has a detrimental effect on families. It has been studied. There's been surveys in, in Malaysia by a group called Sisters in Islam, everywhere. I'm a fan of polyamory as it is practiced by everybody. I believe it is men and women's rights to have multiple partners if that's what they choose. I wore, thank you. I wore hijab for nine years. I chose to wear it. I chose to take off the hijab, but it took me eight years to take it off. Why is it, why is it harder? to choose to stop doing something than to choose to wear it. Okay. And FGM, my extended family has had it extensively, much to my heartbreak, and it is something that I'm obsessed with, and it's taking us too long to get rid of it. It exists here in, in, in India, the Buhari community has it, but I understand that there is a successful petition that has been begun to break the taboo and to stop the practice. So I hope that within a generation we can get rid of all of those things. Very good, and is also speaking on this. I'm very sorry there's no time for any more questions. There's a lady making uh, throat cutting gestures and uh, I need to obey. So thank the panel very, very much. Uh, fantastic discussion. Really, really good to hear from you all. And I'm not sure whether Muna or Vali, whether you're signing books at the back. I think Mona, some people are waiting for Mona. So after the Arab Spring, a lovely session. Thank you, Mona Al-Tavi, Suleiman Adunia, Wali Nasser, Omar Baguti, Lale Khalili, and Gerard. Thank you for this lovely session. Mona will be going at the back of book, book signing, and we have a next session here, bang on. It's a conversation about this book on JLF sessions, conversation at Jaipur, the spirit of JLF with Amish Tripathi, Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Urvishi Vitalia, and Sanjuroi.